Hey everyone, we're Nick and Rachel. If you're new here and haven't been following our adventures around the world so far, then typically this isn't our general style of video. Normally we are vlogging our travels around the world, but this series of videos is a little bit different to the norm. As we travel through the various countries that we've been able to enjoy, we've noticed that there are certain things that are a little bit different to what we're used to in both Canada and the UK. The reason that we have this channel is to share our travel experiences in the hopes of inspiring others to travel more. With that, we want to share some tips and tricks that we've picked up along the way in each of the countries that we've visited, so that if you want to go to the same places, you'll be armed with some helpful information that will make planning and navigating around a little easier for you. Today's video is going to focus on traveling around Costa Rica. If you've been watching our videos, you'll know that we went to Manuel Antonio, Monteverde, La Fortuna, Rio Celeste, and Tortuguero as part of our travels. While a few pointers will be specific to these places, the vast majority of the rest of them will be about the country as a whole. We hope that you find these useful. Our first tip or trick is about car rentals. When you go online to look for a car rental, you will be offered two very different types of car rental. There are going to be super cheap ones that look too good to be true. And then there are going to be other options that are about the same price as those you would find in North America and Europe. The ones that are a little bit cheaper are typically smaller cars, smaller SUVs and not necessarily 4x4s and the more expensive ones are definitely 4x4s that are more powerful. Having road tripped around Costa Rica, we can now confirm that our choice to go with one of the very cheap rentals that did look too good to be true was actually fine based on all of the road conditions here in the country. However, the first night that we arrived, we did find out why there are super cheap car rentals. It's because they try to encourage you to buy their insurance. Now, the credit card that we were paying for the rental on does cover us for car insurance. And if we had taken the car insurance the car rental company was offering, we would forfeit the insurance from the credit card company. So that wasn't an option. However, if you decline the car rental company's insurance, they ask for a deposit for the entire value of the car, which as you can imagine, is quite a lot of money because these tend to be newer vehicles and most people probably don't have a credit card limit that high however by phoning our credit card company ahead of time and also understanding the t's and c's when we were booking the car we were actually able to avoid having to pay for the car rental company's insurance and really did get a cheap, cheap, cheap car rental, but had we had to buy their insurance because our credit card wouldn't accommodate the sizable deposit, then the car rental would have ended up being on the very expensive side. Basically, just be aware that this is the system here in Costa Rica, so make sure you're prepared. If you are going to be renting a car, then do bear in mind that there are certain highways going in and out to San Jose that are toll roads. In terms of paying for them, then some are card only, others are cash only. So with that, be prepared to pay with either payment method, depending on the toll booth that you go to. It's not immediately obvious as to which one you're going to encounter every time. In terms of the prices that you're expected to pay, in some cases we've only paid about 200 colones, in other ones we've paid about 600 colones. So whatever the exchange rate is, then for us I think it's about 50 cents to about $2 nearly. So just be prepared that you're going to have to pay that multiple times along certain highways. Highway 27 is the main one that we encountered this, but there may be other ones around the San Jose area where you could be required to pay. Traffic in the San Jose area can be a little bit of a nightmare. 
So do expect it to take a little bit longer than Google Maps has predicted. When it comes to the country and outside of San Jose, I would say that Google Maps is quite accurate in their predictions for how long it's gonna take you to get from point A to point B. The speed limits on the roads are quite reasonable and match the road conditions. So if there's a lot of potholes, then it might be 25 or 40 kilometers an hour. Same as if there's a bunch of twists and turns winding down a mountain. It's not gonna tell you that you can go 80 kilometers an hour. That being said, sometimes there are traffic snakes because trucks can be holding up a line and they don't really climb mountains that quickly. So it might be good to add 10 to 15% more time onto what Google Maps has predicted because some of the roads, as I mentioned before, can be potholy or gravelly and rocky. Although, don't believe what you hear, the road conditions here in Costa Rica really are not that bad and you can manage it in a small SUV. When you do come to Costa Rica, then you'll be happy to know that it is pretty warm here, with temperatures usually ranging between the low 20s and the low 30s. However, what you do have to consider is the humidity, especially when you get to more of the rainforest type areas, because you are gonna sweat a lot, and so therefore avoiding dehydration is absolutely key at all points. Therefore, stay hydrated, but also make sure that you do have air conditioning in your room, as this will be a massive help. Costa Rica is a country that uses both credit cards and cash, Credit cards can often be used at grocery stores, convenience stores, tourist attractions, and also to pay for tours online. Even the boat to Tortuguero, you can actually pay by credit card as well. However, if you plan to go out to eat at a soda, for example, which is a local restaurant, they will likely want you to pay in cash. And most guest houses, Airbnbs, and smaller hotels also prefer not only just prefer actually, most of them require that you pay in cash. So unless you specifically haven't done so when you booked online, then make sure you have both credit card and cash on you at all times. As for what currencies are used, it's kind of a mix. Costa Rica has the Costa Rican Colonis, but they also use the US dollar a lot. If you're in a grocery store, a convenience store, or going to a soda and choose to pay in cash versus if it's possible to pay on credit card, then there you will likely be using Colonus. However, if you're talking about a guest house, Airbnb, a hotel, a tour, or a national park entrance, then if you're paying cash, you're gonna be asked for US dollars. One of the main reasons to come to this amazing country of Costa Rica is to go and see wildlife. And the most accessible way to do that while not putting yourself at unnecessary risk, is to go through a national park. The good news is that there is a parks authority called SINAC, and that is generally the main place that you can go through in order to buy all of your national park tickets for the whole of Costa Rica. However, the main considerations that we want you to bear in mind are twofold. The first is that a number of these national parks are very popular, especially the likes of Manuel Antonio, Monteverde, etc., etc. We've been told, especially in the case of Manuel Antonio, that you will need to book somewhere in advance. I think we were told five days. And I think that that is a good blanket policy for pretty much every single national park that you intend on going to during your time here. The other thing that we want to make sure that you are considering is that CNAC does run a website through which you can buy all of your tickets. And it is very much worth mentioning that certain national parks don't actually allow you to buy your tickets in person at all. Like literally they don't carry any cash. So therefore, the best way that we suggest for all of your national park purchases is to do it directly through the CNAC website. That way you can guarantee that you get the parks that you want to, you can check on availability, you're getting the best pricing, you're not getting swindled by a third party, and if you're running low on colonnas, you can pay for it in US dollars instead. Speaking of national parks, we definitely recommend going as soon as the park opens. That is either usually at around 6 a.m. or some of them open at 8 a.m. But by doing this, you are one of the first people in, if not the first person in, 
and we often found that we had the park entirely to ourselves for the first hour, I'd say. So I think that's totally worth it. Most of the national parks in Costa Rica have a policy prohibiting single-use plastics. That means that you cannot bring in a plastic water bottle. It's best to bring in a reusable water bottle, so make sure that you're traveling with one. The good news about this is that the majority of water in Costa Rica is potable. So it's very easy to fill up your own reusable water bottle wherever you go, whether it be in your accommodation or at stations dotted throughout the national park. And the other thing is that buying bottled water here in single-use plastic is actually very expensive, which maybe they do to discourage that. Another policy that a lot of national parks have is that you are not allowed to bring any food into the national park because this can attract animals and not in the way that you're going to enjoy. Monkeys look cute from afar, but when they're trying to snatch your food, they can be very aggressive and you're not gonna have a good time. Therefore, if you wanna avoid this, then make sure that you plan to have a session in a national park that does not involve any food consumption. However, once you are in the national parks, then it is worth being patient in order to see the wildlife. Obviously, this isn't a zoo. The animals are not easily on display for you. You're going to basically have to wait for them to come to you rather than the other way around. While in certain national parks, there is more of an abundance of visible wildlife that is closer for you to see, such as in Mel Antonio. There are others like Monte Verde, for example, which are over a much larger area. And so therefore it can take a lot more time and for you to potentially go on several hiking trails in order for you to see the amount of wildlife that perhaps you are expecting or hoping to. With that, treat each national park visit as at least a half day session, if not a full day, so that you can get your fill of wildlife spotting. Wildlife tours during the day can be helpful if you don't think you're going to be able to spot any animals by yourself. However, we didn't go on any day tours and we were able to see a lot of animals by ourselves, very similar to the tour groups that we walked by. As Nick mentioned before, just be patient, take your time, especially if it's in the morning, be quiet, try to keep your footsteps as quiet as possible. Make sure that you're listening for like rustling in the trees or of course with birds you're going to be able to hear them without problem. And it may also help to do a little bit of research about where the animals like to hide and live to know where you should be looking. For example, coatis, you should be looking on the ground, whereas for monkeys and sloths you want to be looking high up in the trees, close to the leaves, and then hopefully you'll be able to see as many animals as you want to. That all said, a night walk is an absolute must. This is when about 70% of all of Costa Rica's wildlife is awake and active. So therefore, this is definitely among the better times to go and wildlife spot. However, we absolutely recommend that you do not do this on your own unless you are a naturalist of some variety because you are going to have no idea what to look for and you're going to be basically just having a walk through a dark jungle which isn't very fun and potentially dangerous yes exactly the good news though is that in pretty much every single wildlife heavy area that you're going to be going to be it a national park or otherwise is going to offer some kind of night walk tour we went on one in Tortuguero and honestly it was probably one of the best sessions of spotting wildlife that we had in the entire country. Therefore, if you are an animal enthusiast and you want to make sure that you see especially the likes of sloths or frogs or snakes or anything else that may kind of go bump in the night, then make sure that a night walk is on your list. Because groceries can be kind of expensive, then one of the other recommendations that we would make with regards to your accommodation is that you look for options that include a free breakfast. Even if it's not the most exciting thing that's gonna turn up on your plate, generally speaking, it's gonna involve a lot of fruit and it's gonna be very filling. So that will really set you up for your day, especially if you're planning on doing a hike around a national park. In terms of actually trying to obtain food, then obviously there are street sellers by the side of the road where you can get 
a lot of a specific fruit or vegetable for practically nothing. But otherwise, there are conventional supermarkets that attend to most of your needs. And historically, we've gone for the larger ones, so Maxi Pali and Mega Super, we found to be probably the most comprehensive in terms of the range of products they sell. When you're going out for meals, then you will notice that a lot of the menu items are shockingly pricey, but if you want to try and give yourself the best chance of avoiding high prices when going out, then you want to look for local family-run restaurants which are called sobers. This is also one of the best ways that you can enjoy local Costa Rican food and having been to a few, we can definitely say it is divine and you will love it. So definitely worth trying. In terms of the types of things that you should try, look out for menu items such as casados, gallo pinto, patacones, and empanadas. If you choose any of these, then you generally can't go wrong. We were quite surprised to learn that groceries can be quite expensive in Costa Rica. Some of them are about the same price as you would pay in North America and Europe, and some of them are actually more. For example, we love Nutella and peanut butter, and those cost a fortune here. However, if you choose to buy locally grown groceries, then you can actually save yourself a lot of money because that tends to be a lot cheaper here. So think of bananas, mangoes, pineapple, papaya, avocado, tortillas, and rice. However, another thing to think about is that even those differ in price depending on where you are in the country. Avocados can actually be quite expensive, for example, on Tortuguero. However, I'd say that a lot of the time, if you see fruit stands on the side of the road, they are actually some of the best value because we have seen five avocados for 2000 colonas, which is maybe five Canadian dollars. We've also seen three kilos of mangoes advertised at that same price. So that's just a little tip. You may consider also not going to a conventional grocery store to save a little bit of money on your fruits and vegetables. On the way to Manuel Antonio from San Jose, there is a large tourist attraction called Crocodile Bridge. Keep in mind that if you want to go and see the crocodiles which live under this bridge, then there's only parking on one end of the bridge. If you're driving from San Jose, it's the end of the bridge that's closer to San Jose. If you're coming from Manuel Antonio, you need to cross over the bridge to access the parking. We particularly enjoyed this because it was free to do and the crocodiles were massive and they were the first animal we actually saw here in the country. When you're staying in the Manuel Antonio and Cuepos area to get to Manuel Antonio National Park, it is worth noting that the national park is actually a bit of a distance away from the town of Manuel Antonio. We had also heard that parking around the national park is actually a bit of a nightmare. Therefore, we ended up going with the bus service that runs between Cuepos and Manuel Antonio National Park, and it ended up being fantastic. The service usually runs anything between every 10 to 20 minutes from about 5 a.m. onwards. And in terms of the actual price, then it is 380 colonists, so basically one Canadian dollar each way per person. So it's very affordable and it will get you as close to the national park as you possibly can. You will need to walk a little bit just to get to the entrance to the park, but it is definitely the best and easiest way to make sure that you arrive there if you're staying in Manuel Antonio. Just bear in mind though, that 380 colonias is best provided in change. So if you can provide change, then they will appreciate it the most. If not, then small bills, so we're talking maybe 1,000 or 2,000 colonias, will be acceptable. Marino Baena National Park is located in Uvita, and it's most famous for its sandbar, which is in the shape of a whale's tail but obviously this is only visible when it is low tide. So make sure you check online to see when low tide is if you're planning to go and see this sandbar. 
Otherwise, you're going to find yourself swimming right over the sandbar and seeing nothing at all. Earlier in this video, we did mention that certain parts of the country have a lot of dirt and gravel roads, so you should be provisioning for longer journey times than expected. Monteverde is one of those. There are a number of paved roads, we're happy to say, but generally speaking, there's not going to be an option to get there without at least going on some kind of dirt track on the way. Therefore, just bear that in mind when it comes to your choice of vehicle, as well as planning your day to get to the national park. La Fortuna has a huge number of hot springs, and most of them are owned by luxury spas and resorts and hotels. But there is one that is public and free. It's called El Choyen. You are welcome to park up on the side of the road, and the parking there should be free. The reason we say should is because we've heard stories, we did not experience this ourselves, that there are some people who dress in high visibility construction vests who ask you to pay a certain number of colones to protect and watch your car while you're swimming in the hot spring, but they're not official. So we kind of leave it up to you whether you want to risk not paying them or not. We don't feel like we should advise either way, but just know that the parking is technically free. So is entry into El Choyen Hot Springs. And the only people who are official there are the people who are dressed in gray t-shirts. Another place that we enjoyed while we were in Costa Rica is Rio Celeste, known for its absolutely stunning waterfalls. While with a number of waterfalls around the country, you are able to go into the plunge pool, have a nice dip and cool yourself off against the heat and humidity of the day, Rio Celeste is not one of them, and this is due to the high sulfur content in the water, which will make breathing very difficult. With that, swimming is prohibited, so if you are planning on going to Rio Celeste, don't pack a swimming costume because you're not going to be allowed in. Speaking of waterfalls, one of our favorite was going to Nauyaka, which is about an hour away from Manuel Antonio, close to a town called Dominical. The roads to get there are dirt roads and they are laden with potholes so just keep in mind that it's definitely going to slow you down and when I say slow down I mean maybe 20 kilometers an hour. However, we just had a small SUV and that was able to cope with those roads fine. So please really don't worry about making sure you have an expensive 4x4. A small SUV should be fine for it. Now, in order to see Now Yaka, you do have to go with, I believe there's two tour companies and they offer completely different packages. The one we went with included free parking and then you had the option to walk down which will take about 45 minutes and then be driven back up or if you didn't want to do as much walking they could drive you down with maybe just like a 10 minute walk at the bottom and drive you back up we also had free coffee included they had showers drinkable water there were some board games so definitely a great place to go and spend half a day or even a full day depending on if it's good weather or not Tortuguero ended up being one of our absolute highlights of being in this country. However, getting there is a bit difficult and can be quite pricey if you're not careful. In terms of getting there from the mainland, then you are going to need to park up at a place called La Pavona. There is a parking lot that is specifically designated so that you can get the ferry there and that for us costs 10 US dollars per day that we are leaving our car there. It is worth noting that you are leaving your car under a perfectly shaded spot. It is secure. So with that, you are definitely getting value for money by way of that parking package. And then on top of that, there is an additional cost of the ferry, which is eight US dollars each way per person. You can also get to Tortuguero by plane. We obviously didn't offer that, which is why we're talking more about the boat option. But in terms of the boat option, then it is worth noting that there are multiple ferry companies that do actually take you from La Pavona to Tortuguero. But 
Each of those companies only runs their ferries about six to seven times a day each way. With that, it is 100% worth making sure that you check your schedules ahead of time as the gaps between each ferry can be hours at a time. And obviously, always check schedules for everything so that you don't miss out on anything. Our final tip for Costa Rica is that you should have some basic Spanish because even in the touristy areas, it's not guaranteed that everyone will be able to speak English, so be prepared to maybe use Google Translate, or better yet, go on like Duolingo, or Rosetta Stone, or any one of those other language learning apps. No, we're not sponsored or anything mm -hmm. like that. And brush up on some basic Spanish words. Anything that goes in a phrase book, basically, is a good idea. And also, just make sure that you understand what's gonna be coming back at you because any Spanish speaker generally talks quite quickly. They try and slow it down for you as much as possible, but it can still be a little bit difficult to understand. So with that, pony up on the key and important words, not just so that you can ask the question, but so that you can understand the answer. With all of that said, every single person here in Costa Rica has been so incredibly friendly and helpful. So even if you're just smiling and saying thank you, and hello, you're gonna have a wonderful time, so don't worry too, too much about the communication. You'll get to where you need to go or get what you need. And with that, we've come to the end of our list for Costa Rica. We hope that each of these tips and tricks has been useful to you and that you can apply them to your future travels. However, we do completely understand that what we're saying is not an exhaustive list. Therefore, if you have any other questions or you have any pointers that you yourself would like to share about Costa Rica, then feel free to put them in the comments below. Until next time though, take care. And keep smiling.